welcome you and to introduce Ted Turner, our speaker tonight. My name is Jonathan Moore. I am the director of the Institute of Politics of this Kennedy School of Government. Ted Turner is chairman of the board and president of Turner Broadcasting System, Inc., which owns and operates WTBS Superstation, Cable Network News, CNN Headline, CNN Radio, Turner Program Services, the Atlanta Braves, and the Atlanta Hawks. <laughs> Corporate mergers, indeed hostile takeovers, have changed the American financial landscape with great force. T. Boone Pickens, a corporate Indiana Jones, said in this forum recently that they are a natural part of the process and that they are not a bad thing. Mr. Turner's bid to take control of CBS received enormous publicity and generated great controversy. A successful takeover of CBS would directly have a profound impact on the way millions of Americans see their lives, judge their political leaders, draw their conclusions about the most controversial matters in the world today. But Turner is not just another capitalist soldier of fortune. His target, his real target, was not the coffers of CBS. He has program content in mind. He has values in mind. He has his own philosophy he would bring to this enterprise and to his leadership of it. So the business of Ted Turner is our business particularly because he is a man of many parts of many businesses. You know that he is a champion international yachtsman, but I first met him on a Senate, U.S. Senate pro uh, project in Washington on how to build a strategy which would develop greater political support throughout the United States for a strong public policy of strategic nuclear arms control. Tonight, in the Q&A session, which will follow Ted Turner's remarks, you are invited to ask him questions on any topics that you wish, on any of the various enterprises and adventures that he is involved in. His topic, as you may have noticed from the publicity, is called Channels of Communication. And that evocative, compelling title was crafted when, after many efforts, we were unsuccessful in getting and finding out what it was that Mr. Turner most wanted to talk about. Tonight, at, at a very pleasant dinner with him and others, I've been unsuccessful yet to find out how he wants to kick off this evening and stimulate a general discussion following. So I am very happy. It is a privilege for me and the School of Government to welcome Ted Turner to speak to you on Channels of Communication. This is a very diverse uh, audience, encompassing uh, graduate students, and I understand the general public is uh, invited to be here. They're most of the people uh, that run uh, the local television stations are here, at least the three network affiliates. So it's a very difficult, uh, very, and it's a uh, hopefully it's a sophisticated group. You know, not a bunch of dummies. I mean, you ought to be. <laughs> If this isn't a smart, urban, uh, highly sophisticated, uh, intelligent audience, I don't know where one is, you know? And, and I've been looking for an audience like this for a long time. <laughs> Last night I was uh, speaking at Denison 
University in uh, Granville, Ohio. And last week I spoke at the University of Alabama. I mean, normally I speak to about one college group a month, and this isn't a college group. It's a lot more than that, which makes it more difficult. I feel like it's kind of a responsibility to, uh, and I've been doing it for years, and I enjoy doing it. In fact, uh, I enjoy doing what uh, the right things are, and the right things are a heck of a lot more than just uh, worrying about making, making money. And, and, and I wanted to kind of look the group over and kind of size it up because I do so much talking. Not, not that I'm a great speaker because I don't really work at it very hard uh, because I'm so busy working during the day. I work about 18 hours a day, uh, seven days a week for the most part. I never slow up. There'll be plenty of time for that, you know, uh, pretty soon. <laughs> I'll be rest. Somebody said, when are you going to rest? I said, you know, I'll be resting forever in a few years. You know, uh, there'll be plenty of time for sleeping then. In the meantime, <laughs> let it all hang out, you know. <laughs> so I thought with this group, maybe I'd, because uh, I've learned a lot and I'm still learning, you know. I mean, a lot of people are here because they want to learn, you know. I mean, in fact, I probably everybody in the room here wants to learn something. I'm not sure you're going to learn anything here tonight, but I'm sure that you want to learn something or you wouldn't be here. If nothing else, and to see what that asshole from Atlanta has to say, right? <laughs> and let me tell you about that. I mean, I have more interesting things happen to me. And then when I started out, you know, at the beginning, it's really the first time that you get something. It's really fun, you know, I mean, or the first few times you get it. Like uh, my father said that uh, your first year of marriage, if you put a pea in a jar, every time you made love to your wife, the first year you're married, and then after that first year, you take a pea out every time you make love to your wife, the rest of your life, you'll never get all the peas out of there. I mean, <laughs> and the first time I was in the America's Cup, that was more fun, and you know, it's. But there's no question about it. Uh, the first million dollars I made, oh, that was terrific, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, it really was. <laughs> you know, the first time I, I went out and bought a Ferrari, you know, and I drove around in it, I thought, oh, boy, you know, I cool, you know, and this was back, I've had, I had one of the first auto stereos. This was back in the, in the early 60s, and I was wheeling around this for Ferrari with uh, one of the, fir the first auto stereo I'd ever seen. They just had appeared on the scene. And I had tape with Mario Lanza singing in Italian. I mean, I'm telling you, if that wasn't uh, classy, I mean, and the girls that I was dating in, I mean, you know, all I had to do was snap my fingers. I, I slapped that Mario Lanza tape in there, and I go Ferrari. I mean, I was, I was really, that's right, man. It was, it was out. It was out of sight. I had a lot of fun. That was before we had all these horrible diseases floating around. <laughs> well, anyway, let me tell you how far I've come. I mean, now I'm driving in a Toyota, and I have been since 1974 because uh, I don't believe in uh, conspicuous consumption. I believe that... I really don't. I mean, I fly tourists on the commercial airlines. Uh, when the haircuts went over two dollars, I start, I have not paid for a haircut in 15 years. I, I, of course, I look like it too. Although, you know, five years ago, Playboy magazine picked me as one of the ten sexiest men in America. I mean, it, somebody showed it to me, and uh, I said, "Boy, I mean, the other guys must have a hard time." I mean, I'll tell you. I said. You know, for a while, I took the article with me and showed it to women that I met, and they still slapped me in the face, you know. I, was, <laughs> I just was wondering what a hard time the average guys must be, uh, <laughs> must be having. But anyway, uh, particularly since I got in the news business and got to be, uh, got to be, uh, Got, got really into the media, you know, got into the media and, uh, and started really learning what's going on in the world. Uh, talking with Jacques Cousteau, I mean, I spent a week with him on the, up the Amazon on the, on the Calypso and 
Russell Peterson, the head of the Audubon Society, and spending a week in Cuba and uh, two and a half full days and nights with Fidel Castro, which was the first communist that, uh, that I ever met. And, <laughs> you know, and I'll tell you the honest truth, I, I found him fascinating. You know, I was expecting him to be some horrible person, you know, but, uh, you know, I really wonder if there really are any horrible people. You know, I'm in the process of trying to acquire MGM, and I can't talk about it because we're in registration. But I did. I got some of these old movies that I hadn't seen. And one I got that I hadn't seen, I couldn't even remember if I'd ever seen it, but I knew about it, was uh, Spencer Tracy and Mickey Rooney in Boys Town. And, uh, you know, it's a story of Father Flanagan. And, and oddly enough, I had, had been out and had spoken in, in Omaha, where Boys Town is located, and I met the guy that's running Boys Town now, the, the priest that's doing it. Anyway, in, the, in that, Father Flanagan says in the movie, or Spencer Tracy does, there's no such thing as a bad boy. And I really, honestly, truly believe that. Every single solitary bad person, anyone that hurts other people, or kills other people, or hates other people, is, uh, is, is it's almost entirely, unless there are some aberrations, there are freaks, there's no question about that, but they are so rare. It's all induced into the environment. I mean, it's all induced in the environment. Uh, basically, I believe that we're a very kind, I don't believe that we're killer apes, I believe we're kind as hell. I'd, I see some Chinese guys in there, might be Japanese, hell, I don't know, Hong Kong or, I don't know, Cambodia, I don't know. I see some black kids in here. There's probably some Italians, some Irishmen. Uh, God knows there's some women. I mean, that's certainly a, they ain't a minority. You know, somebody, I said, I figured it out. I mean, as far as the, I mean, what you need to do is get the minorities. You get the women and the blacks and the Hispanics together, you got the majority. I mean, there's no such thing. The minority is the majority, and that's, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, basically, people are damn nice. And that goes for Catholics and Jews and Protestants and you name it. And it even goes for communists. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, that's one of the things I learned. I've been over to Russia a couple of times. I, I got my son living over there. I'm, I don't know about y'all. Well, I did it for several reasons. First of all, he wanted to. He just graduated from college last year. And... Uh, you know, in the Bible, the good Lord, uh, supposedly, we were all such horrible sinners, you know, that we were all going to be burned in hell. He had to send his son down here to die for us. Personally, I don't want anybody to die for me. You know, I'll do my own dying. Uh, and I used to be extremely religious. I really was. When I was 17, I planned to be a Christian missionary. Uh, but, I, but I changed my mind. Uh, really, when you think about it, I mean... The Bible, and it's a, there's a lot of wonderful things in the Bible, like there is in all the old books and all the old religious stories. Uh, and anybody with any common sense could write the Ten Commandments out, or at least the ones dealing with other human beings. I mean, name one society anywhere that doesn't have as a rule in it, a society, thou shalt not kill. I mean, that rule is in every society that there's ever been. Honor thy father and mother. I mean, for goodness sakes, anybody can't figure that one out. If you, if you can't honor your mother and father, if you don't love your mother and father, you're in real trouble. And, and it's a real tragedy because there are some kids that don't even know their mothers and fathers. And that is the greatest tragedy of all. Uh, the greatest tragedy of all. But basically, you treat people decently. You treat them with friendship and respect and dignity and kindness. And everywhere you go, you will find, you know, what they say, what you reap, that's what you'll also sow. Well, that's absolutely true. I mean, I found out, uh, I found that out. I mean, I've been over, earlier this year, I went over and spoke to the inmates of the Talladega prison. I'd received a lot of correspondence from prisoners before, and some prisoners at some southern correctional institution uh, chipped in and uh, made a sterling silver belt buckle for me in the prison uh, workshop. 
because they enjoyed our programming so much because they uh, built a little uh, satellite receiver and, and cable system. So I went over there, and I mean, it was uh, Talladega Prison. The average, uh, the average prisoner's a five or six time offender serving 30 years, and a convicted murderer gave me the little plaque thanking me for, uh, for coming over, and I just walked out. We didn't have any guards or anything. There were about as many prisoners here. They looked pretty much like y'all, except they were all in khaki uniforms. <laughs> they didn't look too different, except there were no women there. That was another thing. I said, boy, I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to be here because there's no women, you know? I mean, until they have co-educational prisons, <laughs> leave me out of it, you know? Uh, and I said, I said, that's one reason why if you guys ever do get out of here, you ought to go straight because, I mean, you know, just looking at them is better than, you know, and they all agreed, you know, I think maybe any of those guys ever do get out, maybe they'll change their ways. But even prisoners are nice guys. And if that's the case, let me tell you something else. I have a pet cougar and two pet bears and ten pet bison. And I can go over, I have a cougar that'll come up and I can pet it just like a cat and it purrs and I can play with it. I got these two 300 pound uh, black bears that I can scratch on the head and feed a cut of apple in sections. I got a 2,000 pound bison bull that'll come out and eat grass out of my hand. I'm scared to death of him because I, he killed a horse one day. Uh, <laughs> but I still do it, you know. And, and if you can get along with all these wild animals, you know, just by being nice to them, God knows you can certainly do it with other human beings. And I'm, I'm sick of the way we're doing things in this world. I'm, I'm, I'm disgusted about a lot of the things we're doing. I mean, for instance, uh, not just nuclear weapons, but all sophisticated weapons. I mean, I'm, I'd be ashamed to live in a country that... Uh, drop bombs on anybody. I mean, dropping bombs, if you want to fight with somebody, go punch him in the nose. But don't drop bombs on him. I mean, on his hospitals and on his schools and on his grandmothers and grandfathers. I mean, don't drop Agent Orange on his monkeys in his jungles. I mean, you know, and mess up his children and his genes and all that kind of stuff and mess up your guys' genes too. Obviously, any kind of chemicals you dump out of an airplane, they're going to destroy all the trees are certainly going to mess up the people and the animals that it falls on. I mean, who do we think we are anyway? I mean, we're just one species on this planet. We don't, we don't own the place. This world wasn't put here for us to uh, destroy. We're supposed to kind of fit in with everything else. Who do we think we are? What kind of egos do we have? And bringing it down to egos and power and everything, people say to me, well, one guy said to me, he said, Turner, what's it like to be so rich and powerful. I said, well, particularly, let's talk about power. I said, let's talk about uh, my children. You know, if my children all got straight A's and did their homework and did great in school all the time, I'd feel pretty powerful. If my wife didn't give me a hard time all the time and my girlfriend, too, give me a hard time all the time, <laughs> I'd feel pretty powerful. If I didn't get the sniffles and the flu and diarrhea, I'd feel pretty damn powerful. But in the absence of those things, and I'm afflicted with all of those things and a hell of a lot more, including the next to last place baseball team when I <laughs> thought I should have done better, you know, I don't feel powerful at all. And as far as being rich is concerned, the only thing about being rich is you're worried all the time that you'll lose it. You know, I mean, if you're poor, you got nothing to lose. You know, it's like if you're on the ground, you got nowhere to fall. You know, the higher up you go, the easier it is to, uh, the easier it is to fall. So I think what we ought to do as a species, I think there, there's three things we got to do if we want to hang around. We aren't, and I can tell you all this because this is, we're right near in the John F. Kennedy uh, school, and he was smart as a whip. And we're right here at Harvard University, which is such a smart group of people. That was where I wanted to go to college and didn't get in. You know, I, I, I was rejected by Harvard, ended up going to Brown. Now Brown's harder to get into Harvard, I understand. <laughs> doesn't mean much to me, though. It doesn't mean much to me. Just proves that, you know, it doesn't matter where you go to college. Although it doesn't hurt to have the best information uh, and education available to you, but you can succeed without it. We've got to get rid of the arms race. I mean, it's been going on between the Soviet Union and the United States for 40 years. 
and neither side's any closer to winning than we were at the beginning. It's just more costly and more dangerous because today's weapons are a hell of a lot more sophisticated. Uh, they're really basically run by computers. And while I think computers are great, I hate to uh, put the future of our, our species and our planet in the hands of them. Uh, as far as handling uh, whether or not there should be a strike or a counter strike, particularly when the average Americans never even met the average Russian. I mean, how can you hate somebody you never met? And I've been over there and met them, and I went over there with the same kind of friendly spirit that I've gone everywhere else in this world. And uh, all I do is have a lot of friends over there. They're my friends. I don't want to drop a bomb on them. I, you know, we're all going to be dead anyway, you know? I mean, what's so... We're all dead anyway. Uh, you live 70, 80 years. You know, all of y'all are smart. What is that? I mean, the species has been here for something like 5 billion years. History's 5,000. The planet's been here for 3 trillion years. God knows how long. I keep getting it mixed up all the... You know, back in the dinosaurs and all those different ages and everything. But I got a general idea. The world's been here a long time. People ain't been here very long. I mean, the redwood trees out in California live to be several thousand years old. There's a plant that lives in the desert. If you saw public broadcasting of the living planet with Richard Attenborough, or David Attenborough, I get them mixed up. The oldest living thing is 12,000 years old. It's a plant that grows in a circle out in the desert. The oldest a person lives 80, 90 years old. Just flip your fingers. Heck, I'm 46 now. I'll be 47 next month. I've been out of college longer than I was in, you know, before I got there. And I, I'll bet every old person my age can just snap their fingers, right? And you were in college. And snap your fingers again, you were in high school. That's how life doesn't last at all. And uh, we're not going to improve things by blowing up the Soviet Union. If anybody gets blown up, I'd rather be the one that gets blown up than the one that does the blowing. I mean, as much as I like living, I would have rather been the people going to the gas chamber in Nazi Germany than the people that were sending them because uh, at least they could go to their death with a clean conscience. You know, I don't want anybody's blood on my hand. Nobody's blood. I happen to love everybody. I like my brothers. And everybody on this planet is your brother and your sister. We are all descendants of the exact same race, Homo erectus, that started in Africa. We are all Africans. We're descendants of Africans, whether we like it or not. We went north and a lot of us turned white like the polar bears, got white, so we could hide in the snow. The blacks that stayed in Africa, I mean, anybody that lives in the tropics has got dark skin because otherwise he'd burn up, you know? I mean, they'd, they'd burn up. And, they, and, and all the people that live in the desert, you, the Arabs and Indians are kind of brown, so they could kind of slip into the sand, you know? So, hey, that's right, it's, a, it's an adaptation, that's all it is. It ain't nothing but under the skin, we're all the same. You, you cut our skin off, man, you'd have to have an expert to tell us apart. That's just one thing. And I'll tell you the other proof of it is, a duck can't mate with a chicken, and a squirrel can't mate with a rabbit. But any healthy male on this planet, and I'm talking about an Eskimo with a glucolic, can mate with anybody in blackest in the Ivory Coast, and not only have a baby, but have a beautiful baby. So we, uh, we got, you know, we, that's the truth, man. And nobody, nobody is going to drop a bomb on his brother except some real dumb, mean son of a bitch. And those are the kind of people I don't want to have nothing to do with. You know, I mean, I really don't. That's number one. <laughs> and the second thing is, the second thing is, once we get rid of nuclear weapons, on a global scale, we have got to get control of the population explosion. There are already too many people on this planet for it to support with a decent status of living for everybody. And we keep on exploding, mainly because we, uh, we did away with the natural checks and balances of disease and plagues and things that kept our numbers in check. Now, if that's the case, that's fine. But then we have to control our numbers ourselves. And the best way to do that is, uh, the most humane way is through, through birth control and through education. And today, uh, that's the greatest problem that the world has after the nuclear, the nuclear arms threat. Uh, in Africa, we're, I'm in the news business and I've got 
access to information that is so frightening, and I'm digging into it because I'm going to let people know what's going on. We're, we're working right now on a major, uh, a major story on Africa, not just that people are starving there. We know that, but why they're starving. Africa can't handle the kind of environmental war that's being waged on it with high-tech uh, high tech, uh, high technology because it's a very, very fragile ecosystem. A very, most of it's uh, low rainfall regions, and uh, when you strip away the grass, uh, as they're doing with the cattle and the goats there, it turns to desert very quickly. And 100 square miles of Africa becomes desert every day. The population growth there is the fastest in the entire world, 3% a year. That gives you 20 times as many people in 100 years. There are 100 million people there currently that are subsisting totally on food aid, and the number grows every day. And it is not sustainable. I mean, there's going to be a massive die-off in Africa, whether we like it or not, because the only reason that we have this huge surplus of grain is that we're farming virtually every available acre in this country, and we're doing it at the price of uh, farming marginal land, and the reason the Mississippi is brown is because our topsoil is going down the river. And that's basically going on all over the world. We're, we're mining our soils. We're running through the natural resources, the stored natural resources on this planet, mainly oil and, uh, oil and gas, which are going to be gone. In, in, they're going to be basically gone during the prime lifetime of the college students in this room. I mean, and buddy, there are going to be six or seven billion people here. And it is going to be a catastrophe. And, uh, but if, if we, we got to, and, and half of the couples in the world today that would use birth control uh, can't afford it. You take Bangladesh, the average per capita income is less than $100 a year. They cannot afford IUDs and pills and uh, prophylactics. And to furnish, it take $1 billion a year to furnish all the women in the world with birth control devices. I mean, you know, don't, I'm not uh, anti-woman or anything. Maybe there ought to be men's birth control. But birth control devices, half of the women in the world, according to the UN and the studies I've seen, would use birth control now that don't have it available. And that would cut the world population growth in half immediately if we just did it. One billion dollars. That's a third the cost of one Trident submarine. It's one three hundredth of our current military budget. And it poses a greater threat to us than the Soviet Union because they're just as scared of us as we are of them as far as the, the uh, arms situation is concerned. And when we get control, and it takes global, as Cousteau says, global education. And we could help with that, too. I mean, we could help with that. With just a, it doesn't even take a whole lot of money. It just takes a little care. And then the third thing is we've got to save what's left of our environment when we get those two things done, because we only have one planet. It's a very small, fragile place, and uh, we're absolutely chewing it up on a global scale. 5,000 acres of the Amazon are cut down every day. As I said, 100 square miles of Africa become desert. We've got to protect every damn tree that's left. We need to uh, plant trees where, where marginal farming is uh, concerned. We've got to clean up, put scrubbers on every smokestack. We've got to scale down the size of our automobiles so we don't even further. We should discourage people from driving automobiles when they can ride a bicycle. And uh, if they can take a motor scooter, we need, to, we need to quit wasting so much. We need to quit. Uh, come up with a different system for sewage disposal so we don't waste six gallons of water every time we go to the, go to the john and flush it back into the water system. Uh, we just need to start doing, acting intelligently. We, uh, you know, in 1830, there were only one billion of us on this planet, and there are four and a half billion people now. And uh, just, we're just running out of room, that's all. And, and, and when you look, look at our planet from the air and you look at our large cities, they look just like cancers. I mean, you know, there's a brown pall of smoke and smog over them, and the trees are gone, and where the world normally was green, it's now brown. It's brown because we're like cancers all over the place. You know, every, every single bit of living tissue has cancer cells in it, but when they start to breed exponentially, that's when they kill the host. And we 
endanger our entire planet. We endanger our entire planet. And it's not something that's three or four hundred years away, boys and girls. It's here right now and is going to have a major, major effect during your lifetime and mine. It's already doing it. So we've got plenty to do. We have a lot to do to straighten this uh, world out. And we've got to work together as a species, all of us working together. And the very fact that we're so threatened without the arms race uh, could be the thing that brings us together because we are not stupid. We are smarter than a tree full of owls. And if we work together, my good friend Lester Brown, who runs World Watch Institute down in Washington, that's on the uh, Better World Society board with me, along with the Soviet and the guy that started the Green Revolution in India, we, we created a little uh, tax-free organization uh, to pay for and distribute uh, television programming that the normal commercial uh, channels won't pay for. Because, you know, General Foods, one of my better sponsors, you know, Bill Cosby for Jell-O, I mean, they, they ain't gonna want to sponsor a program about starvation in Africa because, it, you know, it's just something you want to stay away from. And I'm not public broadcasting, and public broadcasting, and they're terrific, uh, I love them. They don't want to take on too controversial, not really controversial issues. I mean, for instance, right now tonight, uh, there's a program on WTBS on CNN. It's the 40th anniversary of the United Nations. And we did it, we completed the documentary last week that uh, is so beautiful. I mean, I, I literally cried when I watched it about the UN. We, we need the UN. The UN is no more perfect than we are. Just like our government here in the United States is no better than we are. I mean, we've got the kind of government that we want. We want to be $300 billion a year, $200 billion in the hole, even though it's going to lead to the financial ruin and fall of our government eventually and, and is going to result in the loss of our freedoms because there has never been a government that economically collapsed that uh, was a free country when it was over. That's how Hitler rose to power. If we can't manage our own affairs intelligently, balance our budgets, I mean, um, and I'm ashamed of that too. I mean, we should be better than that. You can't, uh, you can't do that. And then there's no damn excuse for it. There's no excuse for being stupid, you know, particular acting stupid, because we are smart. Lester says that in order to save Africa, which could be done, it will require the same sort of effort and mobilization that it de did to defeat the Axis in World War II. And I, having studied that situation down there, but that's something that the Soviets and ourselves and the rest of the rich world, the rich world where we live, where we, 5% of the world's population, consume 35% of the world's resources, where our children, who account for 2.5% of the children in the world, get over 60% of the dollar value of all the toys in the world. Of course, it's mostly junk. But, I mean, isn't that a damn disgrace? I mean, and besides, it is junk, 90% of it. I mean, in the third world countries where a father takes a little block of wood and carves a little doll for his daughter, that doll means a hell of a lot damn more to some little girl than some piece of plastic garbage that uh, Coleco turns out. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're a nation of junk, and we waste. Let me tell you what else we do. The average American eats twice as much meat as is good for them. And every pound of meat takes seven pounds of grain. I mean, if we just cut our meat intake in half, we'd have enough food to feed everybody in the world without farming our marginal land, and we'd all be healthier. You know, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't eat any meat at all, and they're the healthiest people of all. So, uh, you know, let's have some questions. They said, line up at the microphones. I don't know where, you know, and I will, okay, yeah, you're up there. All right, I'll, let me recognize people so we don't have too much confusion. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, I, I, a lot of the things you talked about tonight deal with what sounds to me like uh, a lot of redistribution of income and a lot of government intervention, not only nationwide, but worldwide. Uh, I want to know, are you a, are you a socialist? 
No, but well, listen, as a socialist, what is it? Is it what is a socialist? Is a socialist they put an eight there? Is a socialist is a socialist someone who has wants to take somebody else's money from them forcibly and redistribute it? Yes. Well, I don't believe in that. I think what you should do is deliberately redistribute your uh, income. That's what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm spending virtually everything, every little bit of excess I have on creating programming uh, and intelligent programming that addresses these subjects because I have a tremendous sense of responsibility. And I can tell you how unimportant having a whole lot of money is uh, or having I never really have had the money in my hand, uh, but on paper from time to time, my worth is, uh, has been extensive. Uh, <laughs> so I speak from experience. I think it's the least important thing in the world. I, I would rather be a high school uh, teacher and feel good about what I was doing. I mean, I've met a lot of the richest people in this country. And boy, I'm telling you, they are a miserable lot for the most part, particularly the ones that only love money. Boy, if all you care about is money, see Citizen Kane or see the uh, movie about Howard Hughes' life. See, take a look at what uh, somebody that only cares about money and see, uh, see where that gets you. That gets you. You're all alone when you die, buddy, I'll tell you that. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Turner, you are clearly the Mother Teresa of news. <laughs> but I wonder how you square that feeling about people in the world with what some might consider a, a more cynical attempt to build an empire of communication and one with the with respect to the CBS takeover bid that's that's ideologically and perhaps politically um, designed to uh, to fight what you consider to be that bias in the news that let me tell you I mean I I have uh you know, everybody said I wanted to change the CBS News. Well, not everybody said that. Anybody that knew anything at all uh, or, or really read what was going on, uh, I haven't watched more than two hours of the CBS News in the last 20 years. I don't even know whether it's biased or not and could care less. Uh, I didn't intend to uh, get CBS to mess with the news. Once I got it, I'd look at it and see whether I liked it or not. If I didn't like it, I'd change it. Uh, but I don't like the entertainment programming on any of the three networks. I think it's uh, too materialistic, too stupid, too sleazy, and too violent. And I think it's, uh, it is, it's, it's the television and movies are responsible more than anything else for the tremendous decline in this country. Decline. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Turner, my question is about the international... Uh, implication of what you have said. And uh, while I endorse your three points, uh, how about the implication of new international economic order? Because coming from India myself, I imagine that much of the things are uh, much in favor of international economic institutions, are much in favor of developed countries. I will give one concrete example. I went to the best law school probably in India, and I used to pay $36 a year. And here, at Harvard, I pay $10,000 a year. Harvard is definitely better than Indian law school, but it is not 300 times better. I love that. We just, uh, in January, we're going to present a two-hour documentary on India that, uh, that we worked on for four months. And I, I haven't seen it. I'm going to, ben, ben Kingsley uh, is narrating it, a finite world series, and a woman produced and shot it, <laughs> assisted by some men. There is no question that the third world is in a lot worse shape vis-a-vis -vis the rich world today. And I don't like calling it the third world, you know? I mean, I think that sucks. Because first of all, that's where most of the people in this world live. And that's really the first world. You know, let's call it what it really is. I'm sick of hearing it called developing countries. Hell, they're mainly going down the drain is what they're doing <laughs> because their problems are greater than ours. And we, we, I don't think that we deliberately, that we deliberately are taking advantage of the third world. 
what we're doing is we're doing it kind of without even being aware of it. We have such tremendous economic power, the West, Europe ourselves, that uh, we can pay pretty – or we can come up technologically with substitutes for any of the third world's commodities, and we can keep their prices down, and we do. I mean, sugar prices, banana prices, rubber prices, everything that the third world produces virtually, except for oil and now even oil. Uh, the prices are below what they were 20 years ago, but the things that we sell to them, computers and uh, and farm machinery, the things that they can't uh, make for themselves, we get double or triple what we did. We, we have such economic power. I, I have a plantation down in South Carolina, and I have a number of people that work there, Rob, and they make the minimum wage. I mean, they, I, we provide them housing. Uh, they, you know, they're really farm hands. And, 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 and for the most part, they, they need to borrow $50 every week. They're always $50 uh, in debt. They really have no economic power whatsoever. They can't afford to leave that farm, and they've got to – they really live at, totally at, uh, at my will. If I wanted to let them go, I don't know what in the hell they'd do. I mean, look, I'm just telling you, this is the, the same situation, uh, the same situation. They can't afford to go anywhere else. They don't really have the knowledge or the education to really uh, do that much more, and uh, that's really the way the third world is. Uh, we're living higher on the hog than we've ever lived. Americans, I mean, 10, 12-meter syndicates, uh, maxi yachts, three cars, two sets of – I mean, it ain't one house anymore. Most people got two houses. If you ain't got a beach house, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, you were lucky to have one car in the family, and mom got it on Friday night to go get the groceries. Now, if your wife didn't have a car, I mean, what are you talking about? I used to walk 10 blocks to school. Nobody does that anymore. Everybody drives to school. You know, it's uh, – uh, and we just have so much economic power. Now, I don't know how you go about changing things around, but what we have is a very dangerous situation. If you go back and you're a student of history, when there are a few very wealthy – that are pigging out in a world that is surrounded by poverty, which is what we have at the current time. That is a very dangerous situation for the rich. That's basically was the situation that occurred in, in France prior to the French Revolution. And that's what was the situation in, the, in Russia before the Soviet Revolution. And that's the situation in the world today. And we are – that's one reason why we need to be real nice. And that, the Indians are damn nice to us, and so are the Chinese. I mean, you know, if you ever knew a lot of poor people, and I've known a lot of poor people, poor people are usually nicer than rich people. We're really lucky that the third world hasn't really taken us to the woodshed. Uh, you know, it's one thing that because we're because we're so wasteful too. I mean, I'm just telling. You, I mean, I I've never really let it out the way I have tonight. But, but I think we're really wrong, and I think we're living in a very, very dangerous situation. I don't care how many goddamn nuclear bombs we have. Uh, it's not stopping the Mexicans from coming in here. And, and Jacques Cousteau told me, and I agree with him, I, I really do. He said, Ted, let me tell you what's happening in Central and South America. He said there's an explosion going on down here in the population. And he said, if the United States puts its entire armed forces, shoulder to shoulder on the Mexican border, each man manning a machine gun, shoulder to shoulder, and you turn every bit of your manufacturing capability into building machine gun bullets and the uh, webbing to feed them into the guns, he said, you aren't going to be able to stop the flood of Central and South Americans that are going to walk across the Rio Grande into the United States. And it's happening right now. Before 1990, more than half the population of Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and California is going to be Mexican and other South American groups. So we're going to be overwhelmed anyway. We're in the process of being overwhelmed today uh, by this influx of people from the uh, – what we call the third world. That's why we really need to help them with population before it's uh, – too damn late, in my opinion. I mean, you know, because we're going to go down too. Who's wants to? Yes, sir. Mr. Turner. 
In my opinion, hey, look, this is one man's opinion, okay? That's Let me make that answer. very clear. I could be wrong, I hope I am, but I'm sharing it with you. And I don't want to depress you either because the situation is not hopeless. All we got to do is turn it around. Yes, sir. Mr. Turner, I agree with your assessment of uh, a lot of the world's problems and uh, also of the dismal shape that a lot of uh, TV's entertainment programming is today. What, uh, why do people watch, you know, Charlie's Angels, Miami Vice, and stuff like that instead of, uh, instead of uh, watch shows that would uh, tell them about the world's problems or tell them about how to solve the world's problems or something like that? And if you know the answer to that, what are you doing to uh, do something about it? Well, that's the bad part of the situation. It, it, it really, people, well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with entertainment for the sake of entertainment. I mean, you can't have all documentaries, you know, I mean, that, that wouldn't be good. There's nothing wrong with, uh, with entertainment because you've got to, to lead a balanced life, and you need to lead a balanced life. It can't be all work and all worry and no play and no fun. You're supposed to have some fun. I mean, that's, you only live once. I have, believe it or not, I have a lot of fun. I'd, be, I'd have a lot of fun if I wasn't here now, you know? I mean, no, I mean, this ain't fun for me. You think this is fun? Because I know I'm, I'm disturbing some people in this room. I'm disturbing people because nobody wants to hear bad news, and I don't want to be the harbinger of bad news. Uh, I like good news. But people, uh, you know, given the choice between doing the right thing and the wrong thing, a lot of times they do the wrong thing. Why do people use drugs? Why do people drink whiskey? Why do people smoke cigarettes? I mean, it's stupid. Why do people be unkind to each other? Why do people steal? Really, for the most part, it's because they don't know any better, okay? And the thing that's so bad about television is the people that run it don't give a damn about the country. They only care about the ratings. They care about the ratings, and, they, and I've got one, I can give you 30 instances of where they've admitted it to me. They know they're doing wrong, and they do it anyway because the same reason that the people that were feeding uh, Jews into the gas chambers at Auschwitz and Dachau, you know, it was their job to do it. You know, that's what they said at Nuremberg. You know, all I was doing was following orders. I was just part of the system. I tell them it doesn't wash. I'll give you a perfect example. I got a former president of CBS working for me. His name's Bob Wessler. And he was there for 19 years. And when he was a young vice president, uh, had just got to the place in, in the organization where he had a chance to have some input, they came out with Kojak and Mannix. And uh, he went into Bob Wood's office, who was then the president of CBS, and he said, Mr. Wood, I've reviewed our fall programming, and I want to go on record as saying that we are putting programming on the homes of the American people that does not belong on over-the-air television. And the president of CBS looked at him with a sad look in his eye and said, Wessler, let me tell you something. I leave my conscience outside every morning when I walk through the doors of CBS at 9 o'clock. And I can, I mean, I had a, the station manager, Van Camford, runs uh, the program director of WSB, which has been the number one station in Atlanta for years, years ago when they ran the newlywed game in prime access. I said, what a piece of trash. And he said, I agree with you. And I said, uh, well, what in the hell are you running for? He said, let me tell you, Ted, I don't let my children watch the station I work for. They can watch your station, but not mine. I said, my God, man. I mean, what about your responsibility to your community? And he said, my responsibility is myself. He said, if I don't win the ratings battle, I don't keep this job. And I mean, that is wrong when you're dealing with the public's airways and the communication system that is affecting the next generation tremendously. And, you know, I mean, all you have to do is use good old common sense. The people running those networks know what trash is and what trash isn't. But they run it anyway, and they look the other way like just about everybody else that's doing wrong does. You know, you, if you don't see it, you know? Well, if, if you run on CBS, could you run something that people would watch that would be better? I certainly would try. I certainly think so. I mean, it wouldn't be that bad. I mean, uh, back in the old days, uh, the programs worked. The Cosby Show, which is the number one program in America today, is just fine. You know, the Waltons was fine. Little House on the Prairie, the Brady Bunch was fine. Perry Mason was fine. Star Trek was fine. Uh, 
Groucho Marx was fine. Jack Benny was fine. Ed Sullivan was fine. I mean, he'd go on. Uh, I Love Lucy was fine. Andy Griffiths was fine. There, there are millions of programs that were fine. And even some of the Westerns were okay. I mean, what? I'm talking about the real, and I don't even watch the programs. I, all I do is I, I ask Wessler, he watches them. I said, what's it look like this year? He says, trash. So I just keep on criticizing it. <laughs> yes, sir, you up there. Hi. Um, I think from what you've said tonight, you are certainly a well-meaning man. But uh, if I could go back to a question that was asked over there a little bit, um, and that is, it, this, by the same token that fairness in media really would not be good for the public, don't you think that anybody with any kind of biased view should not be running or owning a, uh, a, a company like CBS, which has so much... Well, how do you know fairness in media? You just made a statement. Fairness in media uh, wouldn't uh, be good. How well, do you know? They never have run anything. So. Oh, okay, no, no, but what I'm saying is, don't you think it would probably be best if media was left to an unbiased opinion? And that, and well, let me tell you whether something, Whether it be friend, good or there's bad. No, there's no such thing as an unbiased opinion, even I. There's no such thing as an unbiased opinion. I mean, you're not giving me an unbiased opinion. You're biased against bias. <laughs> you know, there's no such thing as unbiased. It doesn't exist. I mean, does it? Even if you're against bias, you're biased against bias. <laughs> well, everybody's against something. I'm against hatred. You know, there are people that like hatred. I would get along very poorly in Nazi Germany under Hitler. They'd drag me away right now and take me out back and shoot me. Thank God I live in a free country, you know? So, I mean, I think it's... Go on, though. I don't want to... Ask your question. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're being tough. Um, no, but I, really, if you think about it, the media's place, whether it be good or bad, plays a very important role. Um, if, if we look back to the last election, really a lot of the election or the election was won on public image, etc. Um, but don't you think that if you were to own a company like CBS and you came in and started reprogramming, etc., and that's not to say that, that CBS isn't biased, as you pointed out, but don't you think that's just as bad well, that's like saying, you know, I mean, Adolf Hitler was a leader of a country and uh, so was uh, Mahatma Gandhi. You know, I mean, you know, both of them had their own way of running things and, uh, you know, do you think that, that Gandhi was as bad as Hitler? I mean, you know, no, there's a big difference in, in management and management philosophy. You can... You can manage for fear and hatred and stupidity and short-term profits, or you can manage for long-term gains. I mean, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, you know, you're entitled to your opinions and uh, the rest of us are entitled to ours, and maybe a lot of people feel like uh, you do. I personally believe that having responsibility is a good thing. I believe in accountability and responsibility. I think it's real good, real good that we have a, a system where we have to periodically elect our, our leaders. We do have at least a chance to throw them out if they're doing a lousy job. There's no way you can throw out CBS, NBC, and ABC because they don't go up for votes. And uh, all I wanted to do was take my agenda to the CBS shareholders and the management of CBS never even let me do that. So uh, they... they they talk about living in a free country and in a democratic country, but they certainly didn't want the democratic process to appeal to them. They are uh, not a democratic institution. Okay? Uh, good answer. Thank you. Who's? Yes, sir. Do you, do you think that because you have the money with which to buy CBS... <laughs> no, I don't. No. If I had the money to buy CBS, I would have no. bought it. Yeah, but, uh, I had no money. No, the, the question is, though, if you do you think that the fact that you would you could or if you were able to muster the money to buy CBS, that that and then entitles you to uh, deciding what should be put on TV? I mean, simply having the money, what? why does that mean that you should be putting things on the airways? That's a real good question. And uh, if we lived in the Soviet Union, uh, people with money wouldn't be putting things on the airways. What I because mean is, over there, the government handles everything. Over here, we, we, you know, 
And I'm not sure it's the best system. I don't know. I just grew up in it, and I've been playing by the rules that we have here. And in America, if you can buy something, you can run it. That's the way our system works, young man. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it's, you know, shit, I don't know. Maybe there's a better system. That There's only two ways to do it. You can have private ownership or government ownership, but somebody's got to be in charge somewhere. You know, even here at Harvard, somebody's in charge, although it's hard to figure out who most of the time. <laughs> But when you talk about saying, for instance, I don't know how many people here do not like the newlywed show, but some people don't like Star Trek. The fact that you could possibly raise $5 billion to purchase CBS, does that mean necessarily that your judgment is better than the people who do actually watch the newlywed show and others? Well, I don't know about that, but uh, if I owned it, I'd be running it. You know, and if it didn't go well, I'd take the blame for it, like I did for the Braves this year. You know, one thing, you'd know who I was accountable, you know, and you'd also, I'm here. I'm here. I do run three networks now. I know in Cambridge they don't have cable, I'm sorry to say. and You're living uh, television-wise. You're in the dark ages, but I can't, uh, there's not much I can do about that. If you had a chance to uh, see my programming regularly and took the time to watch it, I'd think that you would find it... Uh, Certainly, uh, I believe that I put my money where my mouth is. If, you just, if I could just have shown you, rather than me here talking tonight, this documented where we're running right now on the United Nations, uh, most of you would uh, think it was a pretty good program. Yes, sir. Uh, if you're a free marketist, how do you propose raising the price of gas, uh, meat, water, and to prevent, prevent us from flushing it down the drain? And just quickly, uh, were you reading from prepared text tonight? I have no text at all. Number one, come up here and take a look. I mean, it's, there's nothing here. <laughs> Number one, I didn't say raise the price. You don't have to uh, raise the price. What you need to do, what we need to do is teach our people that they shouldn't waste. That's how the way to make people richer, too. You don't have to raise the price of meat to quit, get people to quit eating it. You just have to explain that it's not good for their health. Then they can put their money into something else, like a savings account, or they can go buy stock in corporations, you know, and, 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 and uh, or, or put it, you know, because if you put money in the bank or you put it in stocks, you put it into the investment system, it creates more jobs and modernization of our industry. It's a hell of a lot better than just spending it on meat. We don't need to raise the price of gas. You just, I drive a small car because I know it's smart. You know, I mean, you don't have to raise the price to do it. Maybe we could lower the price. I mean, you have everybody, you know, spread it around a little more, but not spread it because you have to spread it. Spread it because you want to spread it. You know, I mean, uh, and going back to Christianity, I mean, you know, Jesus said that, uh, Jesus said that uh, he didn't want, he told that young man that wanted to follow him, the rich young man, he said, give everything away and come with me. You, I don't live simply so others may simply live. You know, it's fun. It's not fun to use the most you can in life. The real fun is to use the least you can. I mean, being fat is bad. Being thin is better. I mean, it is really fun to use as little as you possibly can. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. It's Lester Brown. Is a, he's unbelievable. He lives on $12,000 a year and runs this institute. He used to be a farmer. He could be making hundreds of thousands. He could be a multimillionaire. He doesn't own a car. He deliberately lives 12 blocks from where he works and walks to work every day. I mean, he wears a corduroy jacket and wears jeans, and this guy's uh, got a doctor's degree, smart as a whip, he does it deliberately, just like a lot of your college professors do. You know, they're terrific. They, you know, everybody thinks, well, they're kooky, you'd rather go out and be a billionaire, but I, you know, see Goodbye Mr. Chips, you know, that's another good show, the original one. I mean, you know, a life of service is gonna give you a hell of a lot more, uh, more comfort and fun and satisfaction out of your life than a life of personal greed. I can tell you that from having seen it on every side. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I, I first, you, you say you drive a, a, little, a little car and you fly coach. You mentioned that article in Playboy. I like to get upgraded, too, for first, the, if I can. I mean, I'd rather fly first. The, the, I'd rather have a G3. Yeah, I mean, it's a hell of a lot more fun. And the, you the article in Playboy to. said that you, you, that I read, said that you flew first class and then you drove in a limo. You both talked in the back of the limo going back to your place. But I was, first of all, I was flying commercial and I get upgraded a lot. I do get upgraded you said a lot. In the interview, a... You said in the interview that you, uh, well, it said in the interview that you wouldn't let them print it unless you get to proof it. So I was wondering why you didn't change that if you were flying coach. I didn't in that particular time. I certainly didn't proof that article. 
right. Well, and, I, and, and I do ride in limos sometimes, but I don't own one and I've never rented one. The only time I ride in a limo is when somebody picks me up in one and I don't ask to be picked up in one. And I'll guarantee you nobody picked me one up today. I mean, I... <laughs> yeah. the, can I ask you one more question? You, you talked about the, the influx of people over the um, Mexican border. Um, from what I understand, there's 100 million people, from what I understand, that live between the Mexican border and the Panama Canal. And the reason they're coming over the border is both for opportunity and uh, because of the unrest. And there's a war going on in Central America now that's being backed by both the United States and by the Soviet Union. And as long as that war goes on, there's going to be more and more people. And there's estimates there's going to be tens of millions of people coming over the border. And it's not because there's no room because of birth control. It's because of the unrest. How do you uh, propose that we solve that problem? Well, I don't believe. I mean, first of all, if we ever reach an accommodation with the Soviet Union, which I think we should reach tomorrow, uh, one of the things that I would propose uh, is that both of us quit interfering in the affairs of other nations from a military uh, or a military aid standpoint, number one. And number two, I disagree with you wholeheartedly. Certainly some people are coming here to get away from that war. But the most of the people, Mexico is not at war, and most of the people are coming from Mexico, and they're doing it because they can make ten times as much here as they can in Mexico. That's the main reason that they're coming. Well, that's because of opportunity. That's right. That's well, because of money. Because they can't make enough to barely live down there. Well, well how, how, do we, how do we solve the problem in, in, in Central America then? How, how do well, we, one how thing do we, we could... It? It's the, the Central American problem, or the, the, or the war problem in Central America, or the overpopulation problem the, in Mexico. The war problem in Central America. Well, if we should not be... We should not be interfering militarily us or the Soviets or any of the other great powers should not be interfering militarily in the affairs of other nations because all we do is keep the wars going on a lot longer than they would otherwise and we make them a lot worse. We should stay out of other countries' internal affairs. All of us should. If anything, we should offer to try and help to resolve conflicts in the, between these smaller nations rather than encourage the conflicts to go on and spread. I, I, I agree. But after the, the Soviet Soviet backed uh, forces are in Central America, we should still stay back then, even though they're there now. Well, I really think I really think. Not only do I think, I am convinced, and I am. If there was ever a capitalist, I guess it's me. But I'm convinced that uh, if we sit down with them and resolve our differences, I believe that they'll quit interfering if we'll quit interfering. I believe that they'll let us live we, if we we'll let them live. We didn't interfere in Afghanistan, though. There are some places we haven't interfered in that they still do. So That's true. And, and they didn't interfere in Vietnam, either. You know, we, we've had, and in Grenada, Grenada, you know, they were, you know, I mean, we, we've had, uh, we've had, we, we ain't perfect either, you know? We've been involved in uh, the affairs of other nations without the Soviets, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on what impact you think the FCC's scramble to deregulate the broadcast community will have on the fare that's served up to the American viewer. Well, I don't think it, uh, I don't think it can get much worse. So, <laughs> and I, I think the FCC is, uh, you know, I, I don't think it, their deregulation hasn't really changed things that much. Uh, I don't think it makes a whole hell of a lot of difference. I think. The government in our country, for the most part, is uh, pretty short-sighted and pretty ineffective at the current time. And the only reason is is because the people that do the voting are, for the most part, at the current time, short-sighted and uh, only want uh, prosperity today and aren't really too concerned about tomorrow. That's We got the kind of government that we put in, so we shouldn't really criticize it. Uh, but if we were better informed, and more highly motivated, uh, we'd have a government that would... Uh, there's no reason why we can't have a balanced budget. There's no re reason why the arms race can't be ended. Uh, there's no reason, in my opinion, why everybody in the country can't have a job. There's no reason why there ought to be a drug problem. There's no reason why crime ought to be rampant. But it would take uh, a lot of changes in the way we do things. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Turner, I must admit I'm pleasantly surprised, even being a fellow Southerner, to hear you come here tonight and talk to us about showing compassion and addressing the population problem. And uh, 
environmental problems. That's the first part of the problem is identifying it and raising consciousness. The second part is doing something. What if Ronald Reagan gave you a call tomorrow and said, Ted, come in the office. I want to talk to you about uh, devising some specific programs to take to the summit in about two weeks, uh, three weeks' time. Can you give us some ideas, maybe three ideas, about what you would tell him to talk about? I even, uh, yes, I certainly would. The first thing I'd say to him, because uh, I thought about it, he hasn't incidentally asked me, I might say, <laughs> nor do I expect him to. But I would say, Mr. President, from my own personal knowledge and travels in the Soviet Union, and even though I've never met Gorbachev, I've met a lot of the Soviet leaders. And I am totally and absolutely convinced, not from talking to one or two, but at least 50 different people over there, that they're ready to stop the arms race tomorrow uh, and stop, basically, cooperate. I mean, cooperate for the positive good of the whole planet if we'll just say, we'll leave them alone and not try and say any more bad things about their form of government, and they'll quit doing the same with us. And uh, I'd recommend to him that, uh, that, you know, we quit saying bad things about them, calling them names, like we used to do members of our own country, and some people still do. I mean, you, I'll tell you what. I'll bet you within two, you know, we just made a deal with the Soviets to run these goodwill games. We're putting on another set of Olympics next summer that's a joint venture between us and the, and the uh, Soviet Union. I bet you in two weeks I'd, there wouldn't be, you know, within two weeks I'd have a nuclear, total nuclear disarmament treaty, get every single one of them read with, with as much uh, on-site inspection as we wanted, and in 90 days they'd all be gone. I mean, that's what I think I could do. I mean, you asked me, that's what I think I could do if I had the power to, uh, to do it. You asked me, I answered it. Yes, sir. Tonight you're so outspoken on both waste and greed. I'm curious why you're so willing to pay such outrageous uh, salaries to professional athletes. <laughs> Let me tell you that what is an outrageous salary? You know what, Sylvester Stallone's getting to make one movie now? Eighteen million dollars. Uh, I think Robert Redford's getting a minimum of five or six million. Uh, first of all, I want to win because it's important to uh, the spread of my network. We don't even have cable here in Cambridge. So you don't, those of you here don't even have an opportunity here to see my, at Harvard University, you can't even get my programs. So I'm in a terrible disadvantage and uh, I, there's no way, I'm trying to build up my distribution system so I can reach more people. And having a winning baseball team would be very helpful to me and helpful to what I'm trying to accomplish. And besides, uh, I mean, the ball players get the money, they pay taxes on it. I mean, money doesn't, uh, money doesn't disappear. You know, when you spend it, somebody else gets it. You know, it's just I'm moving it from my hands to someone else's. So this year I'm going to lose $8 million on our college football package. On that, at least I can say, well, at least it's going to higher education. You know, it's easy come, easy go. Where have I got somebody up there? Yes, a young man. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, maybe you could just clarify something for me back on CBS. All right, the impression I got that is if you had your way and you own CBS, the program we'd be watching would be, say, Andy Griffith or whatever, you know, good, wholesome American programs or whatever. They wouldn't all be perfect. Well, not, I mean, be... but, but it would be decent entertainment. Not all of it. <laughs> a lot of it would be crummy. A lot of it would be crummy. But it wouldn't be as crummy as it is now. Yeah, I can't argue with that. But, yeah, uh, because you don't know for sure because <laughs> I don't have it. But let's say, let's say your, your programming in, under your standards was better than what we have now. But you found out that most of America enjoys Miami Vice and garbage junk that ABC and NBC put out. And that in order to keep CBS in the running, you either had to sell it to someone who was willing to put out as much garbage as ABC and NBC were doing, or you had to buy ABC and NBC. Now, I mean, you're a businessman, and I, I know you like to win, despite the Braves, but what would you do? What would I what? What would you do? Would you fold CBS just by No, I I I do what I had to do to survive, and I would keep trying. I would, would never you... give up. I. What I'd do is I'd, I'd try and put as many programs on that were intelligent and pro-social 
that uh, the, the central characters would be the kind of uh, people that you'd like your own children to grow up and be like. Okay. I'd put on as many of those as I could. And if they didn't work, I'd put on crummy enough ones to stay in business. But I'd keep on trying to push towards a better world. That's what I'd be pushing for constantly, and that's what I'll be pushing for until I'm gone. Because that's just... I mean, that's just uh, the way I am. I wouldn't quit. And I, there's no way you can own but one network in this country. I mean, at least one of the big three. I got three networks right now, and I'm planning to start a fourth one. I mean, a cable network, because there's unregulated uh, competition in there. There's plenty of uh, access and lots of competition. But you could only, under the rules, and I think this is right, you know, I certainly agree with that, that uh, one of the, there's three of those commercial networks. And right now, they all do the same thing. They're run by the same people, their philosophies are the same, and they all play by the same uh, set of rules. And it would really be good for this country and this world to have one of them in the hands of a different philosophy. It would be good. I mean, I don't care who it is, it'd be better if they have a different philosophy, because all three of them, you can't tell them apart. But don't you think they're trying? I mean... Well, they're trying to be number one in the ratings. But don't you think they tried to originally start out with a good philosophy? They didn't try hard enough. You know? You know, like, uh, they didn't try hard enough as far as I'm concerned. Can I argue with that? You suppose, excuse me, yes, sir. Address that one, or do you Let's want to Let's get recognized, one? right? Let's stick with the system. Okay, uh, I have two questions. Uh, and I'll ask them, then I'll withdraw. The first question deals with the question that was over there about the baseball players. This is on a different line. How do you personally reconcile the amount of money that's spent on an America's Cup syndication defense with uh, your desire for economy? And the second question is, what are you personally doing and what is TBS doing as a corporation uh, in regards to the situation in South Africa in view of your personal views on hatred? Well, that's two very divergent questions. I, I really think it's ridiculous how much money is being spent on the America's Cup. And when I was in it, I only spent a tiny fraction of what the, uh, what the competition uh, did, or my, my syndicate did, because I really don't believe in uh, wasting money, although the whole thing is, uh, is a waste of money. Uh, no question about that. It's certainly not improving the world any, but it does provide some entertainment for some people, and it's, it's certainly better than apartheid, you know, the America's Cup. So, as far as what I'm doing in South Africa, I mean, I'm, one thing I am doing is we're very carefully uh, covering the South Africa situation in greater depth, certainly, than any of the other networks are because we're on the air 24 hours a day and we have more time to devote to it. It is a, uh, an absolutely tragic situation. It's a tragic situation for the uh, native blacks, and it's a tragic situation from the, for the whites that uh, live there. And it's uh, virtually, from what I know and talking with people that uh, live there, and, and, and I have a guy that's working on a program right now that's lived there most of his life. And it is, it's, it's a situation uh, that's just a great tragedy. And, and, and the reason for it is, It'd be kind of like, uh, let's just say that we hadn't killed all the Indians here, and 80% of the American people were still Indians, and uh, they wanted us out because we were pushing them around, and we weren't uh, letting them get an education or go to school with us and so forth. And of course, uh, the Afrikaners, the people, the white people in Africa, there's nowhere they can go now. They're, the world's full up. There's no more frontiers that they can go to. They got what they think is their land down there, and most of them are going to stay down there and die with it. And what's going to happen is the black Africans are going to overwhelm them at great cost in life and massacre most of them. And a few will get out, but most of them will stay and die. And uh, that's basically what happened in Haiti when there were a few whites and a lot of blacks, and that's what's going to happen down there. And there's going to be a real catastrophe after that happens, like it's happening all over Africa. Because Africa was colonialized, but you couldn't kill all. It, that's the one thing we didn't do, fortunately. My European brothers didn't go down there and kill all the native Africans. 
They killed a lot of them and enslaved a bunch of them. But what they didn't do during colonial times is they didn't really educate them, just like they haven't really done in South Africa. So when they had to get out of the rest of Africa, they left people down there that were not, by education or culture, really prepared to take over and run a modern nation. Like over here, fortunately, in the last few years, we've trying to provide equal opportunity for education for all members of the United States, which we weren't doing a few years back when we had integrated schools, or segregated schools, I should say. Um, real mess. Ain't much I can do about it, to tell you the truth, except uh, cry about it a little bit. I don't see that there's any solution. Yes, sir. You mentioned overpopulation. I was wondering if we could take it down to specific issues that would affect gestation. Recently, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology had an advertisement that was censored on, CB on the major networks, and they had to delete part of it regarding contraceptives. There's also been a growing movement among manufacturers of prophylactics that they feel that they have not been able to have their advertisement, have any proper advertisement on the major networks. I was wondering, as an owner of a station, how you would promote, since you have a sense of, a, since you stated here tonight that you believe in family planning. We run that spot. We're the only network that ran it. We ran it when it uh, came out. And I don't know that we've taken any television ads for, uh, for prophylactics, but we do uh, accept advertising if it's tastefully done for birth control devices. Would you consider uh, advertising for prophylactics? Sure, I would. I don't know how in the hell you can be for birth control and not, uh, not uh, practice what you preach. It's just a real tragedy that you don't have access to our programming here. You wouldn't ask such a stupid question or uninformed question. All right. Hey, listen, we got two more questions. Back to the networks and specifically the, the networks increasing control over professional sports. I guess to me it seems like a, it's becoming, becoming a more serious issue as we almost came to the situation where we had a, where if Toronto had won, they would have been playing baseball in Toronto at 8.30 at night in November. And to me, that seems a little crazy. And I guess the question I have to you is, uh, as a sports team owner, when, when is this going to stop? Oh, man, I'll tell you. There's a lot of things that worry me in the world about what time they play baseball games in Toronto. I mean, that's the last problem I'm worried about. I mean, I could care less. You know. Yes, ma'am. Ted, you, you strike one as such a kind of flamboyant, um, laid-back personality. It's kind of hard to imagine you running a, a well-organized, smoothly running company. Can you tell us a little bit about your philosophy of management? I mean, do you have a, a lot of guys down there in three-piece suits, or are they a lot of little Ted Turners each doing their own thing? <laughs> There's 2,000 people working at the company, and uh, uh, I believe in delegating responsibility, uh, and, and I do so. I just try and, in fact, basically, I've got every single operation in our company has somebody that's responsible for it. You know, somebody's responsible. I have too many people currently that report to me. I've got about 12 people that report to me, which is too many. And uh, when we get MGM, I'm going to consolidate. I'm going to bring in another layer of management or promote somebody. I got to. But mostly what I do is just run around, make speeches, and, uh, and uh, do dog and pony shows and go wherever my management people need for me to be. I'm basically a troubleshooter that goes in where he's called on. Uh, and I let other people run the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And I try and think about the future and strategic planning and long-range planning and stuff like that. Does that answer your question? Yes, Listen. Thanks. Y'all have been very patient. They said this thing ends around 9. I stayed a little longer than I would have normally. I think a half hour is plenty of time. But I don't really get a chance to speak to such an intelligent group. And, I've, you know, we had a little debate here. There was nothing wrong with that. I, you know, all it is is one man's opinion. I told you what I thought. You can reject it if you want to. It doesn't make any difference to me. But I enjoyed being here. God bless you all.